and uh, heating with 100% outdoor air. Uh, I am Mike Lett. I'm the Vice President of Sales for Odell Associates Toronto. Uh, we're the representative for Cambridge Air Solutions. So throughout this uh, session today, if anything comes to mind afterwards, you can certainly reach out to one of your local Odell reps. We'll help you out there. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dave. Hey, thank you very much, Michael, and good morning, everybody. And thanks for joining me today. And just to make sure you uh, can see my screen, you seeing it right there, Michael? Yep, got it here. Awesome. Well, again, thanks again uh, um, and uh, joining me today. By the way, again, the introduction, my name is Dave Benz. I am the Director of Engineering uh, for Cambridge Air Solutions. Uh, we are a manufacturer of commercial industrial uh, HVAC equipment based out of Chesterfield, Missouri, which is just outside of uh, St. Louis. And again, we're going to talk about the engineering principles between heating and ventilating with 100% outside air. And just before we get into the uh, nuts and bolts of the conversation, uh, I'd like to just talk about what are some of the trends that we're seeing in our market. And this was actually a, a trend in a survey done by Ashray a few years ago, and uh, it still is true even through through COVID, honestly, the last three years. But uh, as our mechanical engineers and contractors uh, tell ASHRAE is that one of the biggest trends is the change and the importance of ventilation in projects designs. They're talking about increasing ventilation, the importance of air changes, uh, indoor air quality, particularly as we look at uh, uh, what happened during the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, we had a, a very uh, intentional look at our mechanical systems and how much ventilation uh, that we are looking and de delivering to our buildings. And secondly, still is this com this conversation of energy. How can we lower our total energy uh, footprints? How can we increase the uh, uh, um, energy efficiency of our buildings? Uh, and when you think about those two concepts, typically ventilation and efficiency can be in conflict. It is typically an uh, efficiency penalty to increase the mechanical ventilation system. And so mechanical engineers uh, are put in the middle of this conflict and wondering how can I do both at the same time? And really what we're gonna talk about today is technology that has been proven to do that, uh, where we can increase our ventilation, uh, improve indoor air quality and uh, increase our energy efficiency. And uh, as we talked about, Michael said in the lead in, uh, we are talking about HTHV. For those that aren't familiar, haven't heard that yet, uh, the definition is officially uh, from actually the Department of Energy and ASHRAE is a high temperature heating and ventilation units. Uh, that unit is a performance uh, definition uh, for a 100% outside air direct fired heater with a greater than 140 degree temp rise and a greater than 150 degree discharge temperature with fully temperature modulating controls so that you can meet both your ventilation and your space heating needs in a single device. So think about that. 100% outside air, high temperature heating ventilation, and that's going to be the core of our energy efficiency story. And you may ask yourself again, how can it be energy efficient to heat with 100% outside air? How is it energy efficient to heat with such high temperatures? And we're going to go through those principles today. And so what's some of the history of HDHV? Where did this technology get started? Uh, so it, it has a very long uh, proven track record, actually. Uh, we introduced uh, the S-Series uh, in uh, uh, out of Cambridge in the mid-1990s. And really what uh, separated HDHV from other traditional harmless and outside air or direct fire and makeup air equipment was that ability to heat that hit that 160 degree discharge temperature. And it just transformed the way that we design uh, warehouses and large distribution systems. And how did they transform? Well, the first moment was uh, early adopter design build contractors found that they could reduce their total install cost by over 40%. If you looked at most warehouses and distribution centers designed 20, 30 years ago, very typical to see uh, lots of 30, 40, maybe even 50 uh, unit heaters strung around the perimeter of a building, lots of install costs, lots of gas piping, lots of labor, uh, lots of roof penetrations, and they were able to replace that system with four, five, six, maybe eight, eight units. So much lower install costs, much less gas piping, single roof penetration. And so contractors were able to get projects faster with a lower install cost. Secondly, end users saw their energy bills cut in half uh, because of the 100% outside air, uh, sorry, the 100% combustion efficiency of direct fire, which we'll go into a little bit later, uh, and also the high temperature, high uh, velocities, they were able to reduce their total energy bills and they were cut in half. Additionally, one of the concepts we'll talk about today is that 
they actually had free ventilation. These systems did not have mechanical ventilation before. They were somehow getting their uh, ventilation because buildings were really leaky and just natural infiltration around the edges met their 0.06 FM per square feet. When you think about all of those three at once, lowering our total install costs, lowering the energy footprint for the end user, and actually increasing the mechanical ventilation is what transformed that market and why we see this technology and others like it really becoming the standard for most large warehouse and distribution design. So today, I want you I want you to think about what are going to be the three takeaways uh, from our uh, uh, time today, and really it's the three pillars of HTHV. First is inherent safety, second is energy efficiency, and third will be simplicity design, and we'll go through those one by one. But as always, I'm a manufacturer at heart. We always start with safety, so let's let's dive into that inherent safety. Um, so again, framework, what are we uh, type of technology are we talking about? Today, we are talking about HTHV or 100% outside direct fire product. Many on this call may be more familiar with the traditional makeup air, low temperized um, direct fired systems, which are somewhat similar to the HTHV with a few key differences. Um, both have no heat exchanger, no flue losses, or 100% combustion efficiency, meaning all of the available BTUs in the natural gas system are combusted and delivered to the space which equates to about a 92% sensible or 92% thermal efficiency. The biggest difference between the high temperature HTHV technology from the makeup air low temperature is where we put the blower in respect to the burner. Most common makeup air systems are a draw through system where the blower is downstream of the burner and it's drawing the air across the burner such that the, the, the blower, the bearings, the mechanical components are in the hot air stream. Because my components are in the hot air stream, we limit the discharge temperature to about 120 degrees because we don't want to uh, um, reduce the life expectancy of our, our motors and bearings. So the key concept of what HTHV was allowed to do is we move the blower upstream of the burner. Now our mechanical components are protected from a low temperature environment. And if we can uh, what we were able to do is solve the combustion challenges with having the blower, the burner, right downstream of the burner. But with clean combustion, proper combustion, we can now uh, dial that discharge temperature up to the maximum that our safety standard would allow, which is 160 degrees. So now we can pack a lot more BTUs in a much smaller box with a much more protected mechanical components. And hence, we now have the HTHV technology. So, um, uh, like I said earlier, as a, a mecha uh, mechanical engineer and uh, a manufacturer at heart, we always start with safety. And uh, oftentimes when I uh, introduce direct fire technologies to new uh, engineers or contractors, they may ask yourselves, how in the world is it safe? There's no flu. You're delivering the product combustion to the space. You must be killing people left and right. Well, when we talk about safety of any combustion, we're really talking about byproduct combustion. And the key byproduct combustion that impacts safety is CO or carbon monoxide. And to give a frame of reference, the CDC actually did a study on carbon monoxide poisoning. And what they found is that on average, every year there, there's about 15,000 emergency room visits in the US alone and about 500 unintentional deaths. And in that study, what they found that Two thirds of those carbon monoxide exposures were caused by automobile exhaust, lack of ventilation, stuck in a uh, garage, garage closes, car keeps running, and CO levels rise. Additionally, one third of those CO exposures was actually caused by an indirect fired home heating system. They actually found that there was no, not zero, not one single carbon monoxide exposure caused by these direct fired makeup air equipment, even though it's designed to deliver the product combustion of space. And so what's the root cause? What happens when our home heating systems fails? We get a crack in the heat exchanger. We get a crack in the heat exchanger and a little bit of that carbon monoxide starts to leak out in the system and we recirculate and recirculate and recirculate and those concentrations starts to build. So what becomes the root cause in all these situations? It's the lack of adequate ventilation. So in the automobile exhaust exposures, in your home heating, cracked heat exchanger failures, if you don't have adequate ventilation, your carbon monoxide levels can increase to unsafe levels. But let's step back and think about what is the system we're talking about, whether it's makeup air, direct fire, or HTHV. We have a single blower delivering our combustion and our ventilation air. And so we have 
enough ventilation to make sure that we are never able to increase or build up the products of combustion. So all of our products are certified to the Canadian and US harmonized standard, Z3.4, which limits our carbon monoxide uh, uh, levels to five parts per million addition. And again, because we are always gonna be ventilating, we can never build up those products of combustion. So like I said, there's a long track record, proven history. These products are widely deployed across many industrial, manufacturing, commercial, if you've ever walked into any commercial kitchen, any fast food restaurant, there's a 95% chance that, that system was delivering ventilation to the space with a 100% direct fired combustion technology. Uh, it is allowable to meet your ASHA 62.1 minimum ventilation codes. And again, it is CSA certified for safe, clean combustion and zero clearance to combustibles. Now there's a term on this slide, which you may not hear of, uh, oftentimes not in our uh, ASHRAE world, but inherently safer design, which is a common technology, common concept in industrial manufacturing of how can we make the system safe even without the use of engineering controls. Now, our standard does have uh, engineering safety controls, uh, excuse me, does have engineering safety controls such as uh, airflow pressure switches, modulation systems, high temperature limits. But even without the, even if we remove all those uh, engineering controls, the worst carbon monoxide levels we've ever been able to test is 10 parts per million, which is still five times lower than the than the US OSHA standard and still two and a half times less than the Canadian standards of what acceptable carbon monoxide levels are. But again, the key concept, I cannot separate the blower, um, the combustion airstream from the ventilation airstream, so I can never combust and not ventilate. I will always be, um, providing fresh air, and so I can never build up any levels of, of uh, byproducts beyond what my discharge are. So that's the safety concept. Happy to go in more detail if anyone has questions there. But the second concept, if the first question wasn't, how are you not killing people with your uh, direct fire products, but how in the world is it efficient to heat a building with 100% outside air? I'm sure we've always been taught from a very young age, close the door, you're letting the cold air in, you know, where you're raising the barn, um, I always like this slide. This uh, this uh, uh, picture is actually from a, a dormitory, I think at Virginia Tech. It says, you know, please shut this door completely. Our cold air, water, strangers, robbers, orcs, Nazgul, Death Eaters, Voldemort will be able to enter. All of those terrible things happen when you bring in outside air. But as engineers, we know first and foremost that if we are designing a building for human occupancy, we require outside air. People, buildings don't exactly need to breathe, but people do. And that's where we have ASH 62.1, which helps us understand how much fresh air do we need for proper ventilation and proper air quality. Secondly, our mechanical codes tell us that this air must come in through either mechanical ventilation or natural infiltration. So I have to bring this outside air and it can be either through cracks of construction or mechanical ventilation. And when we think about this portion of our air load, of outside air ventilation infiltration, this becomes a significant portion of our total heat loss. And depending on your application, depending on your type of construction, and depending on your temperatures and insulation, this can be a very significant of your uh, portion of your total heat loss, anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of your total heat loss, with the balance being your conduction losses. So, we're going to talk about energy efficiency in this session. So, what would be the most energy efficient way to heat that air that air loss? Well, let's take a very simple system. I have a building that has 10,000 CFM of outside air requirement. We're going to use, in this case, a zero degree design temperature, and I'm trying to heat that building to 70 degrees. A very simple system, blower, burner, I heat that air to 70 degrees, no heat exchanger, no flue losses, 100% efficient, and this now becomes the most energy efficient way and most cost effective way to heat your air load. The, from a, a thermodynamics perspective, that equates to about 869 MBH of total output. So here is your most, again, energy efficient and cost competitive way to heat your air loss. Again, this also key concept is why 95% of all uh, kitchen ventilation systems use this system because they have high ventilation requirements, they use a lot of energy, and they are obviously very cost conscious. So this is why you see all commercial kitchens utilize this type of system. However, most commercial kitchens don't have very much conductive losses. They have so much internal heat gain. But what about our buildings? What about large warehouse distributions? 
What about the additional heat losses from your conduction load, from it being cold outside, warm inside, and all that thermal mass? Well, one simple concept is you could add an indirect fired system. You could add an indirect fired unit heaters, recirculation systems, the indirect fired heat exchangers in a package rooftop, other air turnover systems. However, all of those systems are going to be limited from an energy efficiency perspective by that flue loss. They're always going to be leaving some elements of heat going out their flue. So let's think about this though. What if I'm able to dial up the discharge of my ventilation system and every degree above space temperature now becomes usable heat to heat any other losses, or particularly in this case, to heat my conductive losses. I'm, I still have the same blower and I also still have 100% combustion efficiency. So now I can take that ventilation only system device increase my discharge temperature up to 160 degrees, and now I have all this available additional heat with the most energy efficient way to combust gas, and I can get another 1.1 million BTUs of heat to heat any other losses, or in this case, conductive losses. So this really what is becomes a critical factor to making HTHV is we take a low temp rise, 100% efficient ventilation system, but by dialing up the discharge temperature and having all that additional available heat to heat our losses, I can do a lot with one single device. The other, now when we think about, uh, uh, to help you get a frame of reference, what types of applications do you see HTHV uh, deployed in? Primarily what we're seeing is what we call high base spaces, you know, facilities that have anywhere from 24, 30, 40, 45 foot tall ceilings. We're trying to heat a space. What's the killer for energy efficiency in those high base spaces? Stratification, right? Hot air rises, it's less dense than cold air. We want to get that heat to the optimal floor, but it's naturally going to want to try to rise to the ceiling. So how do we address it? Well, Many, many, many design engineers have utilized HVLS fans, pair fans, zoo fans, even simple paddle fans, just ways to get that heat down to the floor. And what, what we actually have designed into HDHV is this concept of high velocity and induction. So uh, our HDHV technology delivers that high temperature ventilation air, typically 20 to 30 feet above the floor at 1500 feet per minute. And what that high velocity does is it actually helps induce uh, air movement and air turnover in the space without having to add additional fans or large volumes of air inside of the mechanical blower. By using that high velocity, we can suck that warm, stagnant air from the ceiling, pull it down to the floor, mixing with my high temperature and splashing the floor with that, that uh, ventilation air from the space but now inducing about 10 CFM for every one CFM of air movement. So I get massive amounts of air distribution in the space without having to add ductwork, fans, or large uh, mechanical fans to get air movement. And what we've seen through countless building studies that in a wide variety of applications and temperatures and geometries, we can get a very uh, even temperature, floor to ceiling, wall to wall, with very small devices. Uh, depending on your application, we can get anywhere from three to five degrees, again, floor to ceiling, wall to wall, uh, with a very simple system. So um, one of the beauties of our uh, of our partnership with Odell and Cambridge is that we can help you uh, solve your design problems. Every building is different. Every uh, geometry may be different. Every goals may be different. But we can work with you to help you look at heat loads, run heat loads for you, understand what's my ventilation needs, What's my infiltration needs? What's my conduction loads? How are we going to be operating the building and separating my racks, maybe some people working, and get the proper placement of units to get a good distribution of air? It's a very flexible technology, has 10 models available from 250 MBH all the way up to 3.2 million BTUs. Uh, again, very small. A 3 million BTU heater is about the size of your kitchen table and weighs less than 2,000 pounds. Uh, and it can be installed horizontally or vertically. Uh, most common applications we see are the top two, the through wall and the rooftop horizontal. Uh, however, sometimes you might get into maybe an industrial facility where I don't want to put anything through the roof. Um, I don't want to use up floor space. I may have you know cranes that are going through inside the uh, building. And that's where the outdoor verticals become very popular because we can get all that heat attached to the building uh, with only about, you know, a 10 to 20 inches of uh, ductwork inside the space, 
Uh, and so we could still get all that available usage of our uh, cranes. But again, wide flexibility for whatever types of building challenges that you see. So we're going to go into the, the nuts and bolts of the energy efficiency portion and really get into what are the thermodynamic principles when I'm heating with outside air. And again, let's go back to refresh our memory back in the beginning. What is the difference between draw through makeup air, at low temperized and high temperature heat ventilation? Because you may say to yourself, hey, I've used makeup air. I've used off heat buildings 120 degrees all day. It's just as efficient. It's used in 100 percent combustion. Uh, let's actually go to see how the thermodynamically that impacts your heat design. So let's go into the differences. Again, draw through makeup air technology versus blow through HTHV. They both have constant volume fans. The blower is in the hot air stream of a draw through system versus a cold air stream in the blow through. And is my density going to be different? How is my density going to change and how is that going to impact my ability to heat? We also talked about earlier, but again, just to uh, uh, remind ourselves when I use draw through makeup air systems and my mechanical components are in the hot air stream, I need to limit the discharge temperature to protect my mechanical components. Otherwise, I will be burning up motors and bearings every few years. So. Mass flow rate differences, higher mass flow rate, lower mass flow rate. You're probably telling yourself, well, I don't really talk about mass flow rate that often when I'm designing buildings, but we're going to go into why that matters. So this is a fun little simple equation that uh, many folks in this call may have not seen since their thermodynamic days in college, but uh, it is the convective heat transfer calculation and formula which governs our entire industry. And what it says is that total heat transferred is equal to mass flow times specific heat of air times delta T. What you probably didn't hear me say was volumetric flow times constant times delta T. I've heard many people have different numbers of what that constant is, but our, I'm sure we've all been taught roughly the same rule of thumb when we got into this industry was BTUs equals 1.08 times CFM times delta T. Well, why does 1.08 not work? Why can we not use this when we're looking at 100% outside air direct fired systems or indirect fire systems for that matter. And the reason is that 1.08 takes on a pretty important assumption. It takes on the assumption that I'm dealing with standard air or 70 degree air at sea level. Are we dealing with standard air in these applications, whether it's a high temperature blow through system or a low temperature draw through system? We're pretty far from 70 degrees. We are not using standard air. So how is that going to impact my mass flow? I'm going to have different densities. So let's look at, we're going to actually go through thermodynamically the differences between the low temporized and the high temporized blow through. So again, both have a constant volume fan. My draw through is processing 120 degree air. My blow through is processing zero degree air. The difference in density of my blower airflow is 26%. That means I have 26% more mass per CFM of my blow through system than my draw through system. What does that mean from a BTUs perspective? That means that I'm delivering 26% more BTUs for every CFM. If I, if I keep CFM constant and compare these two technologies, because I'm processing that dense air in the blow through system and I'm allowing that air to expand through the combustion, I'm delivering more heat. Conversely, the draw through system, it's already heated up, so I'm actually bringing in less air and I'm waiting for it to be expanded through that draw through system. Well, how about discharge temperature? Again, mechanical components limit my discharge temperature. I can only go to about roughly 120 degrees. That means the blow through system, because my mechanical components are in the cold air stream, I get 33% more temp rise. How does that mean from available to heat the building? I get 33% more BTUs transferred if I hold CFM constant. Let's add those two factors together. More mass flow, more temp rise, 26% plus 33%. I now deliver 68% more BTUs for every CFM. That is some of the critical components of why HHP becomes so, so important and so energy efficient is I can heat with less air. I get back more BTUs in a smaller box. 
I get more temporized, more mass flow with less connected CFM, and that greatly improves my ability to heat the space. Let's go back to the uh, earlier concept when we talked about the importance of HTHB and what we call usable BTUs. So if we think about that, the only BTUs that I can heat my conductant load are uh, BTUs above space temperature. So I don't care how much energy you use to heat to 70 degrees. If I'm trying to heat a building to 70 degrees, only how much BTUs I have above 70 is what allows me to absorb and uh, that those uh, heat losses from the conductive loads. So how do we cover that conductive load? Again, every BTU above space temperature is net BTUs. Let's take that factor into account and um, compare my draw through and blow through. Now, if we take 120 versus our 70 degree temperature for the draw through system, I have roughly 50 degrees of usable BTUs in that system. The blow through now has 90 degrees of additional BTUs. If I compare those, that's an additional 80% of net BTUs to heat my conductive losses. 80% more usable heat for every CFM. And if I take that 80% with my 26% more mass flow, that means I now have 127% more BTUs for every CFM. That means if I am chasing the heat loss, if I'm chasing that conductive loads, I can do that 127% effect more effectively with my blow through system, meaning I can heat that with 127% less CFM, with less air, without overpressurizing, without adding air to the air load, without wasting all of that energy. So that's really becomes the critical component to how our buildings become more energy efficient with HTHB. I'm going to share a few examples of some uh, case studies at the tail end of the presentation. But the other key concept we talked about is simplicity design or lowest total install costs. So these devices have massive value for the money in a single device. A single S1600 provides the same effective heat of six high efficiency condensing unit heaters, provides the same value as some destratification or large HVLS fan, and the same value of having your dedicated outdoor air or ventilation system to temper and meet my ventilation needs. So now with a single device, I can heat, I can ventilate, and I can destratify all in one. And so again, when we think about simplicity of design for my mechanical engineers, even my architects of the world, they love the simplicity to have less equipment, less lush connections, less wall penetrations, less, less roof penetrations. Uh, for anyone out there that loves using unit heaters or uh, um, uh, infrared systems, you know, those systems have so many roof flues uh, that have to be, require roof penetrations such that, you know, our architecture customers, that's one of the biggest callbacks they get are um, uh, water leaks in their roof. And if we can now eliminate all the roof penetrations, think about all those 30, 40, or 50 flu vents that we can replace with eight through wall high temperature HHB systems. It actually improves the integrity of the building envelope. It makes our buildings tighter. It removes a, a failure point for our roof and water ingestion, which again is one of the biggest callbacks for our general contractors and architecture friends. So very simple design, lots of value packed into a single device. So this is a, a framework, you know, we've been talking about energy efficiency for, for years at Cambridge and trying to help uh, our uh, mechanical engineering community and mechanical contractors adopt a high efficiency uh, heating and ventilation system. And now when we think about um, uh, where the conversation moved, we're not talking about carbon emissions, right? You may have clients today that are asking, how can I reduce uh, the carbon emissions of my building? Uh, and oftentimes, we forget that energy efficiency has been a carbon emission reduction strategy for years. And it's actually the first available tool for us to look at when we're lowering carbon emissions. So I'm going to share a few examples of buildings and case studies that we've done that have demonstrated not only the performance from a heating distribution destratification technology perspective, but also the energy efficiency and carbon reduction and uh, carbon emission reduction that we've been able to provide for our, our customers. So the first case study is a retrofit case study against unit heaters. Again, unit heaters are a widely deployed uh, common heating uh, device in many distribution warehouse spaces. And so this building happened to be a roughly half a million square feet facility located in Cleveland, Ohio. And the graphs that you're seeing over here on the right 
uh, are actually temperature loggers that we put throughout the building to try to measure what actually is happening inside the building during the coldest temperature of the winter. And the, the color temperature you see at the top, those are all space temperatures located anywhere from six feet above the floor, directly below the unit to all the way down at the end of the throw to you know two feet above the ceiling to try to measure temperature distribution not only you know front to back but also floor to ceiling the black temperatures is what you see is the outdoor temperature so how does this impact and what am i seeing during those those extreme cases during the winter and what this building saw they were complaining about poor uh, temperatures cold dock areas poor indoor air quality they had no mechanical ventilation uh, they had high gas costs, and if you can see the spread between all those temperatures, they had a very uh, drafty and un uncomfortable uh, environment for their employees. Well, they retrofitted that building with six HDHB units. They put four S units directly above the dock doors, blowing to the back of the unit. They had two larger S series blowing from the back to the front, and they saw very even temperatures. Look at the color of those temperature grid. Very, very tight, really roughly three to five degrees, floor to ceiling, wall to wall, and they saved massive amounts of energy. This building saved 31% total uh, energy reductions and over $60,000 of uh, gas costs. Now, again, that's just the cost of energy. What about CO2 reduction? They actually were able to, to reduce that building's use by 317 metric tons of annual CO2 equivalents. So the HHV technology and added mechanical ventilation where it happened, think back to the very first conversation, how can we add ventilation and reduce our energy? We did that in this building. We improved the indoor air quality and were able to lower their energy footprint and carbon footprint. Here's a very common large industrial uh, application. This happened to be uh, a, another retrofit case study of an industrial facility that had a large boiler system, about eight buildings being served off the common boiler, totaling over about a million square feet of heated space. Uh, again, this was a heavy manufacturing space. They had very uneven temperatures, cold drafty areas. You can see I mean, some of these temperatures are uh, spanning anywhere from 50 to 75 degrees, so 25 degree variation in the type of space. Very high maintenance costs with the boiler and pump system and high gas uh, and electrical bills. They retrofitted that system with what I would call a decentralized space heating system and put a series throughout the buildings and throughout the spaces uh, and distributed natural gas piping in the building. And they had much even temperatures. You also see if you see these dips in the building, they added a uh, nighttime and weekend setback system and had tight temperature control improved ventilation, much lower maintenance costs, and look at both the gas costs and the electrical costs compared, you know, we were at uh, 55 cents per square foot of gas costs in the hot water boiler system versus 38 percent and a much lower electrical cost. We didn't have, we got rid of all those boilers and pumps and uh, um, energy use from the pumping system. That was about a 42 percent total reduction in energy costs, about $310,000 of annual energy savings, very quick payback system. And again, this project was not looking to optimize our carbon reduction, but they were able to save almost 2,000 metric tons of annual CO2 reduction. Massive uh, uh, CO2 equivalent uh, removal story here. Again, we improved the indoor air quality, added mechanical ventilation, and reduced massive amounts of energy. Um, this is the last case that I'll show you. It's a, a kind of the, the proof in the pudding for those that may say, hey, I use low temperized makeup air today. It's just as efficient. I don't know why I need to dial my discharge temperature up. I don't know why there's much of an energy efficiency story by moving the blower in the front of the in the front of the uh, in the front of the burner. But this is actually two identical buildings. Identical tenants. Um, the difference was one contractor utilized the Cambridge HHV system and another contractor utilized a low temp rise draw through system. Both were same for squidage, both same insulation. Uh, they were located in different uh, cities. One was in Kansas, one was in Ohio. But again, the data is normalized based on heat and degree days. And what you see, if you look into the details of the heating systems, I know there's a lots of, of data on here, but look at the differences between the total MBH and the total CFM. And that really shows you back to the thermodynamics that we talked about earlier, what happens if I change my, my blower and my burner systems and I change my discharge temperatures. 
The low temporized make up air systems had to provide more air. They had to add uh, roughly um, 10 percent more air because they're processing the, the hot, less dense air. And they had to provide sorry, they had to provide a much more air, not not 10 percent. They had to provide uh, about 50, 40 to 50 percent more air and they had to provide more BTUs because they had more air and less net BTUs. They actually increased the total heat, the total connected heat. They had much more ventilation and higher horsepower, you know, 95 total horsepower from the HHV versus 150 of the low temporized ventilation units. And even all the added additional ventilation air, all that added uh, distribution, and they had much more indoor temperature variation compared to the HTHV. Again, this is a very tall, this is a roughly 36 foot tall distribution center. Uh, had roughly about a 10 maximum of 10 degree stratification. Both were 100% outside air, both were high efficiency, uh, direct fired, 100% combustion devices. But still, because we were able to process more heat into a, a smaller volume, because we had all that additional net BTUs, the HHB facility had 47% less total energy costs, about $177,000 of energy savings by utilizing HHB. A thousand metric tons of CO2 reduction by utilizing HTHV compared to low temperature draw through. So the systems may look alike, but the thermodynamics are completely different, and the end result and the energy usage is completely different. So I hope that kind of maybe ch challenged some of your, your thoughts for those that are, are uh, customers and have used HTHV technology before. I appreciate your business and uh, hopefully maybe that gave you a little bit more of a framework for how these systems may work and maybe answer some of those uh, questions or thoughts in your mind. But from here, I'll, I'll open the floor up and be happy to answer any questions that we have uh, from our attendees today. Thanks so much, Dave. That was awesome. Really, really interesting. Uh, we don't actually have any questions in the chat, so I'd invite anybody, if you have anything, please, please pipe up. Oh, here we go. Young engineer, how how is higher temperature achieved and how is combustion products removed from the airstream? Yeah, great, great, great question from my young engineer. Yeah, so um, if you the 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 um, the safety standard that we referenced in the in the presentation earlier is ANSI Z83.4. And uh, again, it is a safety standard that defines the performance of our combustion and uh, the limits of clean combustion to how far we can go. And what happens uh, from a combustion perspective is, you know, the hotter you get, the higher your flame temperature gets, then the worse your combustion gets. So the, uh, that's why most manufacturers are typically uh, lower um, temporized because they get cleaner combustion. What our technology is able to do, and again, because at Cambridge, we actually manufacture on burners. Our burners were designed to be in the blow through and at these high temperatures. And so we've been able to prove and certify to a less than five parts per million carbon dioxide on that discharge. So again, the question was, how do you uh, remove the, the combustion from the building? And think about to, uh, uh, I'll, I'll use a very common uh, um, uh, term and, and technology that's used a terminology used in, in uh, HVAC design, the solution to pollution is dilution, right? Any indoor air pollutant, we wanna try to dilute it with fresh air. We wanna try to bring in fresh air to try to remove those contaminants. And so what we do is we are always bringing in fresh air. We are always bringing in a hump outside air to deliver that heat. So again, I'm bringing in that fresh air, which has very low uh, contaminants, uh, very clean, Obviously, we put filters on the front to filter any kinds of dust or particulate that might be happening outside of space. But because I'm using outside air and having a very low concentration added, I can't build up any combustion devices. I can't build up any of those products. And so again, where the system is trying to bring in and ventilate, but also offset any unintended natural infiltration. So I'm effectively neutralizing the pressure of the building. If you think about these buildings in the to in the uh, peak winter conditions, uh, they have uh, cold air trying to get in the building, so typically negative pressure. And so by bringing in that outside air, I'm actually neutralizing the pressure. And then that, that air is then exhausting through my dock doors, small relief areas, or any other cracks of construction. So we keep our indoor contaminant levels low by always ventilating space. 
I hope that's your question. Great, uh, great first question. Thank you to whoever uh, uh, had the courage to get the conversation started. Yeah, thank you very much. That was great, Dave. Appreciate it. Um, any other questions? At the moment, we don't have anything more in the chat. Um, okay, another one has come in. Can we use a ducting system with this unit? Good question. Can, so can I use a ducting system? We get those questions uh, sometime quite often. And I would say, um, can you? Yes. Should you? Probably not. Um, the uh, If you think about one of the abilities for us, why would we use ductwork? Typically, we use ductwork to try to improve distribution, to try to improve uh, temperature distribution throughout the space. And the cost of that improved temperature distribution is added static, added energy, and more fan horsepower. So the, uh, uh, the applications that these systems are typically installed in are large open high base spaces. And so I'm not really worried about uh, trying to get air from one room to another room. I've got one big open room and we try to get distribution to the space by that induction or air movement high velocity. So I could add ductwork, but it's actually gonna lower my velocity. It's gonna add horsepower and may actually reduce my ability to get temperature distribution. So we actually don't recommend ductwork in a large open space. Now, again, we have seen that time to time. Uh, we may have done some applications where maybe I do have this enclosed space and I wanna tee off maybe a little small ductwork to get to a side building. Um, we try to actually keep uh, every zone to at least one unit. And so what I would maybe recommend is instead of adding ductwork is maybe let's reduce the size and put a separate unit. Again, we can go down to about 250 MBH, which can do, you know, depending on your design conditions, you know, anywhere from, you know, 10 to 15,000 square feet of a high bay open space. If you have anything lower than that, you might recommend um, before you put ductwork on there, maybe a different small uh, uh, zone uh, heating system, maybe a little small uh, uh, unit heater or stick, but um, so I would I would encourage you to try to uh, look at it without ductwork, but you can. It just it actually could reduce your uh, distribution and can add fan energy to it. Perfect. Thanks so much, Dave. Really, really good question came in from Peter here. Can you comment on code requirements to interlock exhaust systems with direct fired equipment? And I would say if you can specifically speak to the HTHV solution here, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. You know, the uh, the the common question is, uh, you know, what do I do with re with relief, and what do I do with uh, um, overpressurization, and uh, making sure that whatever air I'm bringing to the building uh, is able to uh, exhaust. You know, overpressurizing leads to energy uh, energy costs, and so you know we try to have a very low volume of air to. Uh, offset infiltration and many times we're less than the infiltration rate that our buildings would naturally breathe but obviously buildings are getting tighter and during uh, maybe unoperate un um, um, unoccupied times those doors may not be active um, and so the code question specifically is how do we deal with uh, um, interlocked systems to exhaust fans uh, and it depends on on your exact local codes and every local code is different uh, and I know obviously in Canada, we have our B-49, and so there's uh, going to be some impacts there. Um, and uh, I would say we have seen local uh, um, inspectors interpret it differently. Now, one of the things that the code says is you need to make sure that you have um, adequate relief. And the adequate relief comes down to the engineering calculations and the engineer of record. And I have had some engineers look at the calculations for infiltration and they've been able to say i believe that i'm going to have an infiltration rate of say 20,000 cfm i in order to heat my building i need 15,000 cfm plus temporize because i'm actually not pressurizing the space my relief is going to be going through uh, uh natural exfiltration or codes of construction and that would meet the need now i've had some code uh, um, inspectors and some uh, uh, local AHJs say that's not good enough for me i want to see something tied to the system we have done systems where they actually would uh, tie and interlock the mechanical exhaust to the uh, unit so that we're always ventilating uh, uh, exhausting the air from the supply air uh, what i have seen is that typically that may actually uh, um, counter affect some of our pressurization uh, usage. So 
you may uh, reduce the uh, likelihood of overpressurizing the space, but you'll likely increase the energy usage to the building. Uh, maybe even need a little bit of extra energy. So uh, there's going to be some penalties to that. Uh, I would love to talk more offline and see what your experience has been uh, in the projects and the inspections that you've dealt with. But uh, obviously, we're happy to get in those conversations with you. Happy to talk with any of your inspectors, design officials. But uh, it's it's been uh, we've seen some variation to interpretations there. Perfect. Thanks so much, Dave. Just to tag on quickly, the B149 code does have a section that specifically speaks to HTHV. And in most applications, we're seeing uh, only a requirement for a gravity relief damper. A couple more questions have come yeah, in. Thank, so, thank you, Michael. Yeah. Uh, can we use this in conjunction which, with HVLS fans for a large area? Yeah, you know, I think um, I have seen obviously many buildings are are now utilizing the HVLS fans to get that uh, temperature relief and comfort uh, during the summertime. Uh, and uh, I would say I, it can impact and improve the um, uh, temperature distribution. Really, more air movement gets more destratification. What I would say, though, is I have seen uh, maybe a, a quick tip to any of our design professionals. Uh, try not to put those HVS fans directly in front of an HHV system because I have seen where that, that volume of air may actually short cycle my uh, uh, heat and push it back to the unit. We want to get that heat to splash the floor, roll down the aisles and get to the back of the building. Um, and again, I have seen buildings where they actually turned off the HVLS fans in the winter because it was impacting my ability to get that heat to the back of the building. You know, again, um, I have seen th there's uh, different ways and different uh, uh, designs to uh, run your HBS fans, you know, run them in reverse in the winter. But I think it depends as long as you can try to get those HBS fans uh, away from the discharge of the unit and uh, avoid short cycling, uh, you can use those in conjunction. Great, thanks. And one more question has come in as well here from AJ. Can we use variable speed motors? And will that lower energy consumption? Oh, that's a that's a really good question. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, so to answer your question directly, uh, we actually don't use variable speed motors uh, in uh, these systems, partly because lowering the speed would limit the amount of air going through the burner and you'll actually have um, um, higher uh, combustion, sorry, higher bifrost combustion and less flame reliability. So we actually don't lower the lower the volume of the air. Uh, one of the things that we do see, you know, why would you want to lower the air? You may want to lower the volume of the air uh, um, to provide less air if you don't need it. Now, again, most of these systems are designed to provide mechanical ventilation and meet 62.1. So I need it if I'm occupied. Uh, during unoccupied hours or if I don't need that constant ventilation, uh, we actually would use intermittent control. So uh the the kind of theory of actually the most the most energy efficient heater is the one that's off uh, as opposed to turn down because the the combustion efficiency is still 100 percent it's unlike maybe your uh package rooftop systems where i actually get higher lplv when i lower the air the airflow um that is not the case for direct fire it is always 100 percent combustion no matter the firing rate so i actually don't get combustion efficiency by lowering the volume of air i just i just provide less air uh, but again, back to what do we want to do with our HHV? We want to have maximum B use BTUs to try to meet space temperature as possible and then cycle off so we can save uh, fan energy and gas energy. So that's where we actually look at a balance of constant unit and intermittent operation for uh, maximum energy uses and not variable speed. Good question, though. Great. Thanks. Um, that looks like all the questions that have come in through the chat here. If there's anything else, you can jump in quick. Uh, I will take a moment to say, if you do think of something after this presentation, please feel free to reach out to your local Odell office. Uh, we're happy to work with you on, uh, on these applications at any point. Um, and maybe we'll leave it at that for today, Dave. This was an awesome session. Thanks so much for uh, coming to speak with us on uh, a Friday morning before a long weekend. Really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody who joined us today. Uh, great session. Really appreciate you coming out and the thoughtful questions at the end. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you all. All right. We'll leave it at that. Take care, everybody.